hello everyone and thank you so much for joining me Jack Stillman webinar this evening. My name is Temin and I'm from the, um, the campaign management team here at Virtual and it has been my absolute pleasure working with this team up until this point and especially leading up to the investment offer. Now, before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land from which I'm streaming to you today. Virtual is based on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kula Nation, and we pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Now, as you are attending for Jack Stillman, you've probably already, well, I hope you've already expressed interest to invest, and this is your opportunity to learn all about the company from the founders themselves. You'll hear about its past, its presence, and what they're looking to do with their capital raise. So how today's session is going to run, um, the team here will take you through a great presentation that will be approximately 15 to 20 minutes, um, which will be all about Jack Stillman, and then we'll switch to a Q&A session. So if you look to the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see a little Q&A bubble. Now, if you have a question during the session, please pop it in that box. And as we go along, um, we will answer all those questions at the end. Just to preface, we are recording today's session, so if you do have to jump off early, um, a recording will, will be sent around. So without further ado, I'll hand over to founders Jared, Jake, and Tia, and Ziggy um, to introduce themselves and kick us off. So, so we're introducing ourselves. Yes. Go on, take, the, take it away. Oh, okay, I'm Jared Stillman, and I'm, uh, I'm Jared Stillman, I'm the... Uh, CEO uh, and the original founder of Jack Stillman. I'm Jake Stillman. I am son of Jared mm -hmm. and grandson of Jack Stillman uh, and co-founder of the business. I'm uh, Tia Stillman. I'm also son of Jared, granddaughter of Jack, um, co-founder as well. Uh, and I manage uh, social media and marketing. Hey, everyone. My name is Ziggy. I'm uh, the operation manager for Jack Stillman, not the son of uh, yeah, Jared. He's, he's an honorary child. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Oh, do I take it away now? Sorry, yes, take it away. Oh, look, sorry, everybody. This is the first time I've ever done this, so bear with me. Um, we'll take a step back. Yeah, you guys we'll go away. Let the, let the adults talk. Uh, so... This is the first time I've ever done this, so please bear with me, everybody. I'll try and be as professional as possible. I can't promise miracles, though. So uh, thanks very much for taking an interest in the brand, Jack Stillman, and uh, uh, joining us on this webinar. I just want to take you through a bit of a journey about where, how we've started and um, uh, trying to um, impress upon you some of the ambition that we had for the business going forward. So... So, oh, look at that, it moves. So look, uh, our mission at this stage is um, to champion uh, craftsmanship, durability, and timelessness in a disposable world. And I think it's best that I'll probably don't explain that too much. I'm gonna explain that more in the slides that follow. But our vision at this stage, uh, and it's, it's pretty clear with everybody here, that our vision, and that's basically a short-term uh, goal, if you like, but, um, is to create an iconic Australian brand with a worldwide reach. And I'm about to show you how we plan to do it. So uh, stay tuned. Right, our story. Um, as you can see, uh, and you've, if you've seen our video, my grandfather, not their grandfather, it was their great grandfather. Um, my grandfather, Jack Stillman, uh, was the inspiration for the name of the business. But I started the business in 2014 by myself. Um, it was originally started as a, as a home business, something for me to do. My uh, partner at the time um, passed away in 2013 and uh, I had to quit my jobs uh, or the job that I had in FIFO. And, and I just basically was looking for an opportunity to uh, work from home and raise my daughter um, who was uh, two and a half at the time. So uh, that's why I started Jack Stillman. I had had uh, other businesses beforehand and sold them off uh, and was taking a bit of a holiday in the resources industry, but uh, now I had to do it for real. So I've always liked bags, ex-soldier, um, ex-cop. I've always liked luggage and bags. I've always been a bit of a fan of um, 
especially the old school pouches that uh, that we had in the army. And I joined in 1989, so we, we still had old Vietnam era stuff. It was really tough old uh, canvas with like steel buckles that, you know, with thick webbing that flicked into the steel buckles. Um, it was real tough stuff and you'd crawl around on it and through barbed wire and everything. And this stuff was really super tough. And I thought, man, I want to make some, some sort of man bags uh, as they were, you know, coming in at the time that that's that tough, but the guys would go, you know, Aussie guys, especially would go, yeah, I'd wear that, you know? Um, so I experimented a little bit with, uh, with, with uh, designing some bags. They were truly atrocious. I apologize to anyone who bought one of my early designs. I really do. I owe you a beer. They were, <laughs> they were pretty shit really. Uh, but I tried and I learned and I learned and we, we ended up coming up with some good products. Then I tried to um, manufacture um, with, with uh, you know, via Indonesia through Bali, but it was just too difficult. I, was, I wasn't there, I was here. Uh, it, it, logistically, it was a nightmare to try and design stuff and get it made and sent out samples, et cetera. I tried it with China, uh, but um, anyone who tell you that's gone down that road, it's a very, very tricky road. And um, especially in that market, they don't help you. And, <laughs> They'll, yeah, they'll throw you a bone every now and then, but they won't help you. And what you end up getting back is is um, is risky at best. So I just wasn't happy with what we were making, the products that we were making were turning out. So in 2018, um, I was literally uh, researching other brands and, you know, on the web. And I was inspired by the story of a guy called, and I, I apologize, I can't, remember to pronounce, how to pronounce his surname, but Mike, and he was the founder of Osprey, which is a backpack business, was based in Colorado in the US. And, uh, and I was reading his story and he was in the same predicament as me. And he decided to, to uh, he researched it. And at the time took his whole family and they moved to Vietnam and they set up an operation in Vietnam, which is where Osprey's uh, even based to this day. And, you know, they're, they're a multinational company doing, doing really, really well. So I thought, <laughs> Just the kind of guy I am. I thought, right, all in, let's go. So I uh, told my family, told the older kids uh, here, they were still finishing high school um, uh, and living with their mum. And I, I did speak to their mum beforehand and she was cool with it. But uh, I grabbed Maddie, who was eight at the time, and off we went. And Maddie and I sold everything, everything, cars, motorbikes, the lot. And we went off to uh, Vietnam. So 2018, I landed in Vietnam in Da Nang. And, um, and I started looking for a partnership. Uh, to manufacture the bags that I really, really wanted to make. Uh, and, you know, over the coming months, we went to Saigon, we tried these big factories, we went to the, you know, the counterfeit factories that were pumping out these counterfeit bags and things. They'd never heard of wax canvas, let alone knew where to get it. Uh, and it was just frustrating for me. I just felt like I'd made a massive mistake. And, you know, the business was starting to stall because I was over there trying to build something new. Um, but uh, eventually we worked out that the, the best thing, uh, the best solution I had at the time was, hey, I'll start, I'll start my own operation. So, so we did. We literally found uh, Toy, who's with us to this day. Uh, he's, it's Fung, but he's, we call him Mr. Toy. And uh, he was just making counterfeit stuff out of his house with his wife and his, uh, and his nephew, Finn. Finn e. and, um, and it, he just really embraced what we were trying to do. He, he understood what I wanted. He understood the products. He didn't want to make crappy bags anymore. He was, he's just the perfect guy for the job. He just was so taken by the, um, the artisan nature and the, the, um, um, the boutique nature of what we were doing. And look, it's been a partnership uh, made in heaven ever since. He's a, he's a great bloke and he's now our team leader in Vietnam. Uh, and he's uh, he's an absolute um, uh, nutcase when it comes to quality. So we, we're assured in that department. Anyway, long story short, uh, I finally got to pump out the bags that we really, really wanted. Uh, and I'll explain a bit more about our product in the next slide. Um, arrived back in West Australia at the beginning of, uh, well, the end, well, beginning of COVID. And, um, and then from that point, I set up a partnership uh, with my son, Jake, he came on board. I said, you're not working for me. You're working with me in the business. You've got to have skin in the game or I'm not interested. He, uh, he, he took a risk. 
came on board with me as the first full-time employee uh, and uh, fellow director. And then a little bit after that, Tia, uh, we set up our shop in Fremantle and the rest is history. You know, this is where we are now. So um, in the last 12 months, uh, well, in the last three years, we've grown about 365% since 2020, since we opened the store. I'll show you a graph in a minute, and it's like a ski jump. And in the last six months, we brought Ziggy on board. We've expanded our team already in Vietnam. So things are looking good, but I'm about to explain to you what the problem is. So I shall. Tell me if I'm rambling on too much. Well, you can't, but Temin can. I'll, Fantastic. Uh, keep, yeah, keep it just going. mash your keyboard, mash it with your <laughs> fist. I'll get the message. So look, the problem as far as we see it here is slow, is slow fashion uh, versus fast fashion. Now we're a slow fashion brand. We embrace that 100%. What does that mean? I hear you all say. So slow fashion, our emphasis is on quality. That's it, end of story, it's quality. With regards uh, to fast fashion, now uh, to familiarize with the term fast fashion, fast fashion is those brands uh, that you might find that are really, really cheap, they're cheaply made, they're mass produced, and um, and they generally come from uh, you know certain parts of Asia. So there's a lot of that in the um, economy at the moment. I'll tell you, 95% of all clothing and apparel in the fashion industry actually is made overseas. That's that's a fact. So it's five percent. Of, of locally made materials, or sorry, locally made fashion is available for you on offer in Australia. And that's from that's from the Bureau of, of Statistics, okay? So um, I can back that up with a link and several other articles, uh, articles. So what we're facing in this country is a war, slow fashion versus fast fashion. And if you've read the news recently, you will know uh, that slow fashion is starting to really gain uh, on, on fast fashion. There's a real movement, especially in the younger generations, um, to, to, to be thoughtful about where they're putting their money and what they're spending their money on and the, and the kinds of things that they buy. The, the old bio principle, buy it once. Uh, why, you know, instead of buying junk that we all know is going to break down in six to 12 months. So with regards to fast fashion, you can see there on, the, on this chart here, They'll pick two, time or cost. And quality will come second, if at all. You know, there's factories at the moment in, um, in and, well, all, all around the world, including Vietnam, I'm sure, um, that, that basically will make products the quickest and easiest way possible. And, and that is, they, they will cater for the lowest skill level in their factory. So they cannot even make things as good as they can be made if the technical, um, if the technicality of the product is such that the dumbest person in their factory couldn't actually put it together, so these are the things you've got to think about when you're spending your money and, and when you're buying um, your products. So I won't harp on about that too much. I could go on for ages about this stuff, but <laughs> I don't want to bore you. All right. The other part of the problem uh, in terms of our branding is basically that, uh, you know, there's not much choice when it comes to motorcycle luggage and accessories. We, we do count ourselves as a motorcycle centric brand. We um, I'll explain more about that. Just stay tuned. I'll tell you, don't turn off yet. There's so much more information to come. I'll explain to you why we're a motorcycle centric brand a little bit later on. But yeah, the other part of the problem as well is that there's a limited range of products out there for men um, and for motorcycle riders and enthusiasts. Generally, it's all black, it's hard leather, it's uh, cheap leather, probably cheap leather as well. Um, you know, so we, we wanted to add a bit of diversity into that market. And I think we have, I think we've got a nice aesthetic with our product and it stands out and people, guys love it. Honestly, we've had so many comments from guys going, I'm looking for, and I've, I've seen yours and I, I just want that because they want these colors, they want that look. They don't, they're sick and tired of the black hard leather. Those are the problems. What's the solution, Jared? Well, I'm about to tell you. So our target market is generally um, men. Uh, the majority of our market is men. Now that doesn't mean we don't cater to women. Of course we do. 
It's just that the, the, the aesthetic, the design aesthetic of our products is just generally more slanted towards men. It's, it's just men will generally find that stuff more appealing. Now, there are plenty of women out there that find it appealing and like it as well. And we welcome you ladies on board. So uh, men aged 25 to 45, around about 100,000 per annum um, earning. Uh, and they are, and these are people that will make a decision on our brand uh, quality over price. And we see those comments a lot in Facebook. You know, we, we get trolled on a daily basis by people going, oh, your stuff's too expensive, it's ridiculous. Well, we don't want people that don't really understand where our product comes from and how it's put together. If you can't, you know, add all of the, you know, the, the cost of the materials uh, up and see where the values uh, comes from, then, you know, it's probably not the product for you. My favorite expression is our products um, uh, cost, uh, well, our products are only expensive because they're not cheap. So we don't make cheap uh, products. Um, uh, other parts of our target market, just to, to fill you guys in, guys and gals, um, motorcycles. We are a motorcycle-centric brand. That's just a decision I made in the early days. I like motorcycles, forgive me. I do like motorcycles, but I just really think that the branding falls in line with that as well. We make our bags with um, attachments for motorcycles. We, uh, we sort of gauge the quality and the, um, the specifications on the bag based on, well, what if someone needed this bag for a motorcycle? Would it stand up to a crash? Would they be able to put their jacket in there or hold their jacket? Is, this, is it going to be comfortable when it's on the bike? That's just the template that we apply to the, the products that we design. Uh, that way it appeals to our, um, our sort of general market, but it also, it's an aspirational product for people that are just simply interested in that kind of lifestyle. Um, $189 billion in 2023 is the forecast for that market. That's worldwide. It's a pretty big market. We just want a little chunk of it. Uh, luggage and bags. Of course, we make bags and luggage. It's, uh, that's the main focus of our business. And I think it always will be. I think we've really differentiated our differentiated ourselves in that space. And I and I, I don't see a time when that will change. We want to dabble into other bits and pieces like apparel. I'll explain that later. But generally, uh, that's what we do. That's what we do really, really well. And that's a that's a $16 billion US dollars um, um, uh, turnover that that for that industry in, in 2022. Of course, we operate in, in an e-commerce marketplace. The majority of our sales come from uh, e-commerce. We probably only make about 10% at this stage in the shop, in the physical shop. Um, but uh, so the majority of our um, turnover comes from e-commerce. And that is just a massive industry. And I, I definitely think the growth of e-commerce over the last uh, three years thereabouts has been a um, lead factor in us achieving what we have in terms of turnover uh, in the last couple of years. But uh, Australia, the Australian e-commerce market, which we we pretty well stay in that pond at the moment. We do send overseas quite a lot. We've got a lot of customers overseas, but our main focus and marketing is, is centered on the Australian market. And, you know, as you can see there, that's a, that's a massive market, 40.9 billion um, in 2020. That's a 2021 statistic. And then of course, fashion and apparel. We, co we um, coin ourselves uh, or identify ourselves as a um, lifestyle brand. Um, so, we are appealing to that uh, to the sort of motorcycle um, port lifestyle uh, sort of freedom kind of uh, uh, um, um, aesthetic, and so uh, I mean that that in itself is just an incredibly big market to occupy um, or in terms of turnover worldwide, and and so you know we we encompass little bits of those four main markets there. So uh, you know that's what's on offer here. Now the solution, those were the problems and the, uh, the solution is that we make gear that lasts. That's what we want to do here. We don't want to make gear that falls to pieces in um, uh, six to 12 months, two, even three years. We don't want gear that falls apart that quick. Now, part of the reason for that is because I just think it stinks when you pay good money for something and it breaks down. I, I can't stand that. I think it's wrong. Uh, and the other part of it is, honestly, the longer you keep our bags, the better they look. 
I can't state that enough. Every material that we choose, and I'll go into those in a second, they all patina, they all age. The longer you have this bag, the better it's going to look. In fact, one of the comments that was uh, was coined by a friend of ours recently is, hey, you know, this is the worst this bag's ever going to look. And, you know, the picture here, that's brand new. And we really, really love um, that messaging. So the, it's not just buying the bag now, it's buying the bag now because you know that if you look after it and you re-wax it uh, and, uh, you know, you keep it, keep it clean and keep it up to, um, uh, and you maintain it, man, that bag's going to look like a, uh, a real relic in, uh, in just a few years time. And people are going to go, man, that's such a cool bag. That's what we want to achieve. Now we do that by using our premium materials. So we use a, a 16 and an eight ounce waxed canvas. So it's, it's, it's not, um, it's, it's not space age technology, literally it's cotton. It's cotton canvas or cotton woven into a canvas weave. Um, the 16 ounce is so thick um, that, um, that most of our machinists are men because when it comes to turning the bags inside out, uh, you really need to have strong hands. Once you've sewn it to put it together, it's so thick, it's so strong. Um, means it lasts longer. It, it looks great, it holds up, it has a rigidity to it that people love. Um, we also use real brass. This is, a, this is a big one for us and it's something that goes over the heads of a lot of, uh, I said a lot of those Facebook trolls as well. We don't use um, what's called, they call it sometimes antique brass. It's mostly zinc, uh, uh, those, those you, you guaranteed you've got a bag probably now uh, at your house and you look at it and you've got one of those um, snapbook buckles, I, I can almost guarantee you in 95% of the time, it's going to be mostly zinc with a little bit of plating on it. We don't use that. We use solid brass. It's it's real brass. It's non-ferrous. Take it down to Sims Metal and get it weighed and go and buy yourself a Coke or something. It's, it's uh, you know, it's proper brass. Now, uh, uh, why do we use that? Because it's tough and it's strong and because we know that it's going to go off. It's going to go green and brown and it's, you know, you can polish it up and shine it if you want to do that. If you didn't get enough of that in your, uh, in your army service or whatever, go and polish your brass. But we know that it's just going to go off, especially those big buckles and it just uh, against the leather and the canvas, it just looks fantastic. Um, and, we, and then we use vegetable tan leather. Uh, I can't go too much into what vegetable tan leather is. There's a fair bit of information on our website. Vegetable tan leather is proper leather. It's real leather. But instead of sticking it in a barrel for 48 hours, like most of the leather that you get, you know, you get that those leather things and you go, oh, isn't that lovely? And you smell it and it's lovely soft leather and you and it's cost you $29.95. Well, that's, um, that leather has been um, uh, tanned in a barrel for 24 to 48 hours, it's full of chemicals. The smell that you're smelling is actually chemicals. It's a bunch of chemicals that we are now familiar with as the smell of leather. And, uh, and it's, it's weak. It's, that stuff's going gonna, it's gonna to break. In fact, um, in most cases, the leather you have on your outside of your bags, those kinds of bags, that stuff's going to break in about a year or two's time because uh, it's just not up to it. Veg tan leather, on the other hand, takes roughly a month to tan. It's, uh, it's done the old school way, um, the way that man has been tanning leather for the past thousands of years, as opposed to the last, say, 30 or 40 years. It, it takes a long time. It is expensive. Um, but we choose to use those materials because of the way that it will last on the product. The product will last longer and the product is going to look fantastic and it's proper quality. So um, we also... Uh, do uh, we also produce in small batches? We don't mass produce. Our uh, workshop is probably only about, uh, what, what are we using? 16, 16, um, we've got 16 workers uh, at, at the moment uh, and, and they're not all on machines. We've got two specialists uh, that just deal with leather. So we've got two specialists that just uh, color that leather and cut that leather and care for that leather on a daily basis. Then we've got machinists and some admin staff. So we are a small operation. Uh, we need to scale at the moment, but we are a small operation. And what we put what we put out is real quality. And we back that up with a 10-year warranty. There's not many other companies, especially luggage companies out there, that would go that far. We made the decision to do it. 
uh, in 2018 when we were, we were finally making the bags that I that I always dreamed of. And, and I think it's a I think it's fair. Yes, we've had times where we have replaced a bag or had it repaired. Um, but any time that happens, we go back and reiterate the design uh, and and we we make it indestructible and, and that's the goal we want it to last at least 10 years don't challenge that indestructible. don't challenge don't. that yeah don't <laughs> that, to that guy out there that ran over his bag <laughs> on his motorbike a few uh well last year was he ran over yeah. his bag 13 and ah uh, i mean <laughs> it, the bag came out all right but he did wreck the zip so just you know that's yeah but yeah so we do state that you know we, we want you to take a little bit of care of it um there you go and as i said i mean they're down there it's like 98 percent plastic free look i say 98 percent because the zippers that we use are nylon zippers now they're they're a ykk nylon zipper it's actually the world's toughest zipper they call it it's a luggage grade zipper and it's uh it's super strong so yeah we we really <laughs> we, we have had issues with zippers in the past so we're going right you people try and break this and once again that is not a challenge okay <laughs> but it is a very strong zip so uh, and that's the only bit of plastic that you'll find on our bags. And, um, and we think that might be fair. Uh, right. OK. The other part of the solution, of course, is what we've gone on, on, on with before. And that is that we make we want to make authentic old school bags and accessories that improve with age. Now, when I say authentic, I mean, we use proper buckles. We don't have any of that little magnet crap. Uh, stuff to make it easy to get in out of your bags we have proper buckles um, we use chicago screws that are basically male female coupling and they go through one end and into the other and then they screw together uh, it's better than a rivet you know a rivet is basically a thin piece of metal that's been pushed into a little spout and then gets squashed at the end now nah, we use chicago screws they're tough as nails and they they go through and they screw it either uh, you know it just it looks strong Everything that we make is 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 viewed from the perspective of okay, where's the weak bit? Uh, how can we reinforce that? If you look at say the uh, anchor points, for example, on our um, duffel bags, they, we just we're, they're over engineered. Put it that way, they're pretty over engineered. But you know that's a weak point on most bags. Um, even behind, you, you can't see it. I mean, there are pictures I can show you. That I think they're on the inside, but yeah, even behind where the things like Chicago screws and and uh, other rivets are, we actually add extra layers of fabric even behind that so it's even tougher so that you can't pull these things out um once again that's not a challenge but um they, they it's it's pretty tough stuff uh and then we also as i said because we're motorcycle centric brand uh we also add fixings to the back of most of our bags so you can actually turn say our messenger bag some of our backpacks and things into a pannier bag on your motorcycle and uh we see that quite a lot guys just love it they want to attach it to their motorbike it's a pretty great looking piece of kit especially for classic bikes and custom uh, motorcycles mm -hmm. which is our our key audience and just on that without going too far into it we, we love the harleys i used to have a harley great bike solid piece of kit but we're not yeah, we, we 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 love the custom and classic motorcycle scene. Uh, we love Harleys, we love Harley riders and all that kind of stuff. But we, you know, we're not black leather sort of uh, OMCG type guys, and I won't go into it any further than that. But everybody's welcome. Come in and give us a hug. Every we love everybody here. It's too much. Yes, kiss as well. Kiss. Yeah, give me a kiss. kiss. Yeah, we'll give you a kiss. Ziggy, we'll give you a kiss. Yeah. So our marketing and uh, and sales model, just very quickly, is um. Uh, I'll, you know, I won't bamboozle you with this too much. It's more for this um, for the offer document. As you can see here, we have our we have our shop in Fremantle. It's our first shop. Uh, we do have plans for others in the future, but that's not really a priority at this stage. Our websites, where we make the majority of our money, and then wholesale retail. Um, without going into it too much, the uh, um, the, uh, the the issues with wholesale and retail at the moment, also the resellers and wholesalers. Man, we can't we can't satisfy our current customers, uh, let alone the wholesalers and retailers. So so we do have some of those uh, in Australia and around the world, but but we are just struggling to keep everybody happy at the moment, which is a lovely problem to have. But um, that's why we want uh, your help. 
So just a quick timeline, just a brag. This is our brag page very quickly. How are we going for time? Am I gabbing on too much? Always, but you're fine. Always. I'll, I'll, I'll try and, I'll try and uh, not go too far. Uh, what have we got? You can read that. Read it in your own time. Only joking. I'll explain it. There you go. You can see our ski ramp there. That's, uh, you know, we're doing really, really well up to the point where I went to Vietnam. <laughs> And I took my foot off the accelerator and uh, you can see we had some great product. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, when I got back to Australia and we'd, we'd had the operation was running uh, really well in the, in the background of Vietnam, I opened our flagship store and then whoosh, off we went. Um, you, you know, we've, uh, you know, you got Jerry Clarkson there's bought one of our duffel bags. Um, uh, Ryan Gosling. Well, we're going to get to uh, yeah, Ryan Gosling, Norman Readers. We've had quite, you know, uh, we're getting some pretty good traction with some um, popular names out there, which is really, really good. And I think that's uh, it's especially because we are, it's a unique looking product. It's a, it, it's, we don't really have too much competition in that space for the, for the kinds of products that we're putting together. Uh, I don't know, anything else in there? It's great stuff. <laughs> oh, where are we? Okay, so yeah, we do employ marketing and sales. Obviously, we spend a lot of money on marketing and sales. It's uh, as I said because it's, it's an e-commerce business. Uh, I think it's roughly uh, around about ten percent or something like that. We do funnel a lot of money into that. But that's really pretty much what uh, what keeps the whole sales thing happening. Um, and and part of our problem with that, just uh, you know. For the interest of you as an investor, because we can't keep up with demand in our main products, uh, we keep selling out of things like the say the Drift of the Mad 13 uh, and the Nomad bags and some of the other products. Uh, we literally they've been on pre-order a lot of those for like especially for the Drifter, for example, that's been on pre-order now for since 2020, since we launched it. We've never had them in stock to sell in the shop. It's frustrating. Um, and that means that because of that, we've got to pay for basically five or six people uh, to click and come into our store. So one will buy and the others will go away and go, well, I can't be bothered waiting that long. I want it now or they'll go somewhere else. It's so frustrating. Uh, we are leaving so much money on the table. I actually envision that, uh, that once we get into positive inventory numbers, we probably won't even have to adjust our, our uh, marketing budget. We can just sort of ride that wave uh, for a little bit without actually having to tweak it up too much just because we'll be able to satisfy demand for a period of time. But anyway, it is frustrating. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, there's our marketing. Oh, I don't think I could, you, you don't need me to go into that, do you? Um, but we do like to, you know, part of the strategy there is to, uh, obviously, impress, inform, identify, and inspire customers through our example, lifestyle, that kind of thing. But, um, uh, you, you know, it's an aspirational brand. Oh, I really skipped over that. That was terrible, wasn't it? Yeah. Too bad. If, Ask me questions. If, if you go over a little bit, that's completely fine, I reckon. Really? And everybody on the call is just so excited to hear about your growth to date and everything that's gotten you to where you are. So keep it going. Okay, guys. Um, the team, well, you've already met the team. Um, and we also have a, uh, an advisory board, uh, which we're very, very lucky to have. Um, Justine uh, Techlove, she's, she's fantastic. She's very experienced uh, CEO of, um, well, well uh, former CEO um, of uh, Rodin Australia, which is a construction company. Believe it or not, uh, very, very handy for us. You know, we're creatives. The, the kids and I uh, are really creatives at heart. So we we felt that we need uh, some stronger uh, business advocacy in in Jack Stillman, and um, and so having an advisory board just to sort of keep us centred <laughs> uh, at this stage, and then with the capital raise, one of the things that we do want to do is to sort of just shore up our um our financial and um and business integrity in that regard but um you know we've done okay to this point uh but going forward we believe uh in in getting the right help from the right people knowing what we don't know so um tara stringer um tara's uh, doing her doctorate at the moment in uh philosophy with a you know and fashion 
And she's, uh, Tara's really passionate about ethical fashion, um, especially slow fashion and, and um, sort of eth ethical manufacturing systems. So we think that's a huge advantage for us that, uh, that, that, um, that Tara can advise us in that regard, um, how to uh, improve our operations and our, um, our public relations and things like that. And then uh, William. So William, say, um, William used to work for, for Apple for 25 years. Uh, he's an incredible um, uh, gentleman. He lives in Perth now. Uh, he's retired. And uh, he's just got a wealth of knowledge about, uh, you know, things, the US market, project management, those kinds of things. He's, uh, he's, he's, he's a fantastic guy to, uh, to bend his ear. So um, we also have support with book, uh, bookkeepers uh, and accounting. And, and then, of course, the team there in Vietnam as well. Uh, look, these are financials um, that I don't know if it's worth going into those in too much, basically, uh, you know, in, in too much detail in this uh, um, in this format. But it, it can give you a brief overview, and you'll get more of that information when the offer document uh, comes out live. Um, I think that's going to be available by Monday or Tuesday next week. Yeah, exactly. and so that'll give you a bit more information about. Um, what we've achieved in terms of our last financial year financials, and then the last, uh, the, the first two months of uh, FY23, as of 31st of December, uh, 22. But we have made a small profit uh, in the uh, in the last year's um, tax. It was a it was a small profit, but a profit nevertheless. Uh, most of our most of the, uh, of our profit, we, we tend to just roll back in the business. I've bootstrapped this with my life savings uh, over the last couple of years. And, you know, we've, we've never had a big capital injection. We've had, you know, a uh, little cash flow, bits and pieces here and there. But for the majority of it, I've bootstrapped it. Uh, and we've achieved, well, in the last, say, 12 months, the last calendar year, 12 months, uh, we've exceeded 1.2 million. Uh, we really think that um, that there's some uh, massive potential uh, with those numbers alone, based on on our uh, current economy of scale, and I'll and I'll go into that in more detail later. Uh, it's looking pretty uh, sunny as well from the financials from uh, as of uh, 31st of December 2022. We're well on target to um, hit around about say the 1.2, 1.3 for the for the um, FY23 financial year. Fantastic. Competition. So it's, I think it's good for us to, for me to position our brand for you uh, with against some of the competition. And so to show you some, maybe what we're trying to achieve here uh, and who we're going up against. Now, the reason I really like to want us to stay in the, um, the motorcycle lifestyle uh, sector is because we are already in that field and we are already recognized within that field. We had some good luck about two or three, um, about two, yeah, about two, three years ago. Uh, we expanded, albeit too quickly, uh, to some, um, some fantastic locations in Europe and the UK. We we're in Bike Shed, we we're on Urban Rider, we we're in um, Cafe, uh, sorry, um, Royal Racer in France and a few other big ones like that. But at about the same time, you remember the ski curve? Uh, we just went, we just made a big mistake and we went too far, too fast. And we un unfortunately it crumbled like a house of cards. We just couldn't keep up with it. We couldn't keep up with our audience in Australia, let alone sending stuff over the Europe and the UK. So we've still got some residual um, wholesalers uh, and resellers over there that, that we really do appreciate um, in Europe. But uh, and we'd love to have another crack at it one day, but we now know uh, it's one of those things, you, one of those mistakes that you make, and you go, oh, okay, don't do that again. So our company, you know, at that time, in fact, even in uh, at that time in Urban Rider, we we knocked off, I think it was um, Merlin um, uh, bags that they liked our bags better than that. So um, I'll have to be careful saying that, but. Um, but you know, I hope you're not listening. I hope you're not on the call. But yeah, so you know, we're doing comparatively, we're doing really good against some of these sort of long-standing brands, and and that's something that we were pretty proud of. But as I said, uh, flash in the pan because we went too far too fast. So Deus, 
Deus are the are the uh, um, they're the kings of the motorcycle lifestyle brand. You know, Deus really kicked it off. Um, you know, it's an Australian brand. Uh, kicked it off in Sydney. Um, uh, what what are we talking? 12, 12 years ago, there about two thousand and maybe maybe even yeah, 12, 15 years ago. Um, uh, by uh, Dare Jennings and uh, and his crew. And what a fantastic brand that is. Um, it it's just tells a fantastic story, a great story. They have great products. They've got a, a pretty good standing around the world. Uh, they have slowed down in the last couple of years. I don't know, let's not talk too much about Deus. It's an interesting, we'll have a beer and we'll talk about Deus, but uh, they're a great brand. Um, I love what they're doing. Uh, Trick Machine is a... a um, a, a, a company that's based in India. Their stuff's pretty good. They don't use veg tan leather like ours. Their stuff is okay. But, you know, we, we count them as a brand that we watch. Uh, personally, um, our aesthetic is quite different to theirs. Uh, and I think we're heading in a different direction to them. But hey, it's an example of a brand to position Jack Stillman within, I would say. And then Krieger, Krieg is pretty big. Um, they're they're more of a motor, a, a um, adventure uh, riding uh, brand. Brilliant stuff. Really, really good quality. German brand. A uh, good uh, te technical um, uh, quality. Their bags all black and um, quadrura and that kind of stuff. Fantastic quality. Great product. Not at all what we are, but once again, a good brand to position you as an interested investor in sort of well, where do we fit within that? So there's another, a bunch of other sort of brands that we associate with like uh, Kytone, which is a French brand, you know, um, uh, guys, any other examples of Dixon, you know, we, we work a bit with Dixon, those kinds of brands. That's where we sort of position ourselves. Um, uh, oh, Saint's a great example. Another good Aussie brand, Saint, uh, that does motorcycle and, um, and um, work. Uh, lifestyle apparel. So um, yeah, that's where we fit ourselves. And and we really want to rise to the top of that particular sector. We sort of almost got there. We are, we have potential to to really get to the top of that list, I think, in the in the coming years without going too much into it. Uh, but that's where we're heading. That's where we want to be. So I, I'll, I'll just talk uh, very, very quickly on uh, what what we want, okay? Why, why we're asking for investment. So um, we want to expand our inventory and manufacturing. Uh, and we want to do that to achieve, to achieve a, a, you know, times three what we currently are by 2024. And I can give you some other numbers on that later. But uh, someone asked me today, uh, I was in the shop, gentleman, um, uh, Greg was in the shop today and asked me, he said, well, so what do you want to send the majority of the money to Vietnam? Well, no, actually, Ziggy's crunched the numbers and um, and come up with a wish list. You know, consulted the team out there and come up with a wish list. So it's it's what are we looking? Say thirty to forty grand or something is really going to make a massive difference to our operation out there um, because we can we're in a position where we can continue to grow organically. We just need that nudge up. So we think um, around about twenty forty grand, we're going to get some. Um, some extra machines. We need a bigger space. We want to get a uh, cutting table for Mr. Mr. Hoa, although we think Mr. Hoa might end up standing on top of the cutting table, but we'll see. We'll need to, we'll need to make sure we, um, but uh, you know, a couple of other bits and pieces. We basically want to double our team out there. So it's not a massive amount. And, and as I said, all things going well uh, with a bit of lag time, we will grow organically from that. The majority of what we want to spend uh, on at this stage is getting better economies of scale with our materials and 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 just sort of buying um, uh, in bulk and identifying some of some better suppliers. We've got good suppliers at the moment, but we have we have uh, we had plans and ambitions with certain things like uh, you know uh, expanding the the. Um, potential of the canvas that we use, things like that. So the majority of that's just going to go into raw materials so we can make more stuff so we can satisfy demand. Generally, I mean, in a nutshell, that's what it is. We just need uh, to output more so we can um, 
satisfy demand, get into a positive inventory um, situation where you know, you know, we've got good margins on our product. If we get into that uh, positive inventory situation, organically we can we we can take it from there for 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 quite a while. So um, uh, that's that's number one. Number two, there are, are some new uh, staff uh, hires and consultants. Uh, we we are, as you can see, this is it. Uh, in Australia, this is it. In fact, it's not even it. We kick and Ziggy out of the country on Tuesday. He's moving. He's moving to Vietnam with his with his family. Poor bloke. Uh, actually, I'm really envious. I wish I was going there. So we are. We kick and Ziggy out. Uh, so as an investor, I think it's important. We, we're doing this anyway. Ziggy was uh, was uh, this was earmarked for Ziggy six months ago. So we were doing this regardless of the capital raise. We we want um, we definitely want Ziggy there uh, to um, help us scale up the operation in Vietnam, uh, spend the money wisely where we need it, and uh, and and sort of really uh, propel that forward. He's he's already done a fantastic job. He's increased our He's increased our output by, by almost 100% in, in six months. Um, you know, we hit, we've hit peak Stillman, I say, uh, in December uh, with about a $250,000 uh, retail value output um, from our operation in Vietnam, which is bloody outstanding. Um, and we look on target to hit that again in February. Yeah, we actually, yeah. Yeah, so look at the target and hit that again uh, in February, which is pretty good. But of course, we didn't hit it in January because, uh, well, January's um, Tet and New Year, Chinese New Year in in um, in Vietnam and, and Asia. So everyone was just on a holiday. Anyway, um, so uh, we, we've we've really sort of uh, maxed out on our on our output. I don't think we could do any more than that, um, but. We do need some positions filled here. Like we would like, we would love to have ourselves a um, sales and marketing manager, someone who really understands um, that side of things. I've taken us to this point, but beyond that, <laughs> I, I'll tell you the, the way Facebook and things are changing. I, I just can't keep up. I'm and I'm spread too thin. Um, and we also want to look. I just really want to impress upon people that, as far as I'm concerned, this brand is not finished. Um, there's so much more we can do with the aesthetic of our product. And, and I really think it's time that we start bringing some other creative minds on board with regards to the product. And we can really notch it up a level. We, we've already achieved that with some prototypes um, uh, that, uh, that will be coming out soon. And, and I just think the, the upscale in, in uh, quality and, and aesthetic is just gonna be fantastic. It's gonna be true to what we do, true to what uh, what our customers want, but it's just going to bring it up a notch. And I'm sort of really, look, honestly, that's, you can tell I'm a creative. That's the thing I'm most excited about. Oh yeah, money by, you know, get positive inventory and everything, but I just really want to make cool stuff. So I think that's, uh, that's exciting. So there will be a little bit of that. Uh, so product and brand development, that's a bit about what I was talking about. We we do uh, we do want to earmark some budget if we've got some for marketing, especially for the US, and I'll talk about that shortly. Uh, fabric innovation, like I said, this is economies of scale mainly. We want to, um, um, you know, we've got a we've got a supply with we've been with for years, and and they and they're great. But uh, I yeah I dream of uh, of of making our own fabric, uh, and then and then uh, sort of making a, a little a slight technical variations to the fabric to make it the world's toughest wax canvas, that kind of thing. These are the, these are ambitions of mine. And I think if we hit the higher level of what we're looking for, we can definitely achieve that. We've already done the investigation. We've got, we, we, we're ready to pull the trigger on a lot of this stuff. It's just a matter of whether or not we raise the funds that we need. And and of course expansion into north america i mean if you look at the population of of australia what are we 25 mil 25 mil 30 mil or something like that in australia was that going go and have a quick head count jake no, I was um but you know you look at the us market and they're five times the size of us there so we know that our branding would translate well to the us we've had that feedback and um you know, from quite a number of customers, we've got the US is our second biggest market, 
uh, and we don't even advertise to the US. So I don't know how they find us, but they do. So we're always, weekly, we're sending products to the US and they love it. So we just think that um, if we can get into a positive inventory position in Australia, uh, that um, and then build us, you know, build a bit of a um, a bit of a bow wave on top of that. Uh, we could uh, we could start to dip our toe into the US. I'm hoping by the end of 2023. It's all going to. This is dependent on how much uh, capital we raise and if we achieve what we want to achieve, guys. So I, I can't. This is me speculating. I'm not making promises, but this is what I want to do. Okay, I have to be careful. I have to say that stuff. Or or Tamman's going to mute. <laughs> and say and can't say that no just to clarify for everyone all of the um elements will be outlined in the offer document in terms of minimum and maximum targets and use of funds if we were to hit a minimum or a maximum and that offer document will be live when the offer goes live on tuesday next week but please keep going okay i will watch ten and said yeah so uh we think we would uh, basically i mean it's not like we're just making this stuff up. We know exactly how we do it. We'd, uh, we'd start sending, we'd send a container load uh, over from our um, operation in Vietnam directly to the West Coast uh, US uh, with a re reputable uh, 3PL supplier, pick, pack and post for, for those that don't understand what that means. And then we would, uh, we would do direct marketing uh, to the US uh, and, and you know, probably operating off the same website at this stage, you know, we'd take advice on that. But at this stage, we think that we could probably do really, really well. And then from that, obviously, we'd expand our wholesale into the US as well. I, I think there's massive potential there. And I know other um, friends of mine and other lifestyle businesses uh, in Australia that uh, that, that uh, have done the same thing and that they've achieved great results by going um, over to the US. So we think we can do it. And, and that is definitely a major factor on the cards. If we can do it, we are determined not to do what we did with uh, Europe and the UK. Well, we will make sure that we're ready to do it. Now, one of the, one of the um, projects that we want to use to leverage our entry into the US market is a, um, an agreement that we've made with uh, Norman Reedus. Now, I've got to be careful about too much uh, what I say here. Norman Reedus, by the way, plays... He was in Boondock Saints. He plays Daryl Dixon in The Walking Dead. He uh, has his own show on Prime in the US called Norman Reedus Rides. It's on Prime. Uh, what's it? AMC? AMC. Man, if you can, if you like, if you're into that kind of thing, seriously, check it out. It's such a great show. He's got a couple of seasons on there, and he basically just rides around the world with other superstars and uh, on bikes. And it's just, it's like part lifestyle, part comedy show, part. Uh, it's just, if you're into bikes, you'll love it. Um, so, so Norma bought one of our bags a couple of years ago, and we've been in contact with him since, and we've had a couple of calls with him, and uh, he's interested in doing a, a collaboration with us. We have swapped contracts with lawyers. Nothing is signed yet, okay? So I must state that, but nothing is signed yet. We've worked out the nitty-gritty. He's been busy. Um, killing zombies. Killing zombies. He's busy killing zombies. We're busy making bags. And so... Um, yeah, because of the demand and stuff, the way that we've had it, we, we just haven't been in a position to be able to to sort of follow through with that. But hey, you, you know, Jake only spoke to him um, a, month ago. A, a month ago. He's still keen as. So there's a potential for that to happen. As I said, I can't make promises, but there's a potential for that to happen. And we really think that as a leverage into the US market, especially that that bike scene, because Norman Reedus is right into that custom and classic motorcycle scene. He's not into the Harleys and stuff. He's more uh, Triumph and, and those kinds of things. Um, it's just, it'll be a great uh, opportunity for, uh, for us to do a co-branded uh, deal with, with him. Uh, right, this is where we're heading. Um, now, this is speculative, okay? Once again, this is just an, an, an overview to say, well, you know, what do you think, Jared? So, the speculation is that yeah, we've we've hit peak stillman. Okay, we're maintaining that. We believe that uh, hitting that uh, inventory level uh, at the moment, so that two fifty thousand, that's that's a retail value, by the way. That's not what it costs us, uh, you know, per se. That's the value of goods that we're outputting X factory in in in, uh, in Vietnam. We believe if we can do that, then we can hit. Um, 
uh, we can bring ourselves our marketing up. As I said, we can, this will bring up us up into a positive inventory level, and then we will adjust our marketing accordingly. If we can, if we can start hit those numbers and build a bit of a bow wave as well, uh, we think we're in a good position to uh, to to seriously look at the U.S. market. Hopefully by Christmas 2023. I can't promise anything, but that's what we're looking at. And we, we think we could probably triple that output by doubling our, um, our um, capacity in Vietnam, um, simply through the fact that, uh, I mean, one of, the, one of the factors holding us back at the moment is space and, and, and numbers. Um, I won't go too far into the manufacturing side of stuff, but we think if we can double our output, our, our capacity in Vietnam, we'll quite possibly triple our output. Uh, you can debate that um, with us if you want to, but you know that's the way we've worked it out. So that's what we're looking at. Do the math, um, uh, work out if you think that's fair. Ask me questions. Um, you know that's what that's the, that's what I'm laying down. Right. There you go. Come along for the ride. Well, so yeah. Oh, no, I'm joking. It's great. You did great. Yeah. Yeah, Amazing. <clears throat> Thank you so much for that. I might I I crack a beer once I've finished, Tevin. Questions. Fantastic. Look, thank you so much for that. That was an amazing insight into the background of the business and um, a bit of the vision for the future as well. I might kick us off um, while I let a few of those question more, a few more questions come through. So guys watching from home, please jump in that Q&A box and leave any more questions that you might have. Um, now, I'm sure everybody appreciates how difficult it is to get to a point of profitability, um, especially for early stage companies. So this is super impressive. Could you please give us a quick overview on, say, the revenue numbers, profit, and um, you know, if you have them on hand, bags sold today, what your audience is like, just give everybody a little bit of a feel um, at that, at a top level. Yeah. Um... Okay, so oh, his granddad. I'll just leave it, mate. We'll just keep Sorry. granddad on there. Do we? Uh, I was trying to get rid of the screen. Um, yeah, look. So, so as I said, I mean, the main the main point is that that we want to impress upon people is that um, is that we have uh, we've hit peak Stillman. We can, we've 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 hit them. Um, we we can't fulfil demand, especially on big products like uh, like the Drifter. For example, I mean, the drift is a great example of what we really want to do and what we like to do. It's not a bag; it's a um, it's a it's an all-purpose poncho. I mean, it's just an idea that I had for a few years, and we put it together, and we had no idea it was going to be so popular. Um, so, uh, the main thing that we want to do is just just hit a, uh, levels of pop popular inventory. We've done, as I said, in the last calendar year, about one point um, one point two uh, million in in uh, in turnover. Our Amazing. margins are pretty, are pretty healthy. Uh, you know, generally we're on a um, a five hundred percent markup x x factory uh, in Vietnam, and, and that's so that's x factory. So we so we then take into account things like uh, the shipping and other uh, you know marketing and all that kind of thing on top of that. So we try to keep our margins healthy. We're not necessarily sitting on that at the moment. Um, uh, you know, just because of you know issues with inflation and stuff like that at the moment. So we're just trying to. Um, um, uh, we're just sort of trying to um, sort of keep things moving, um, but uh, but uh, yeah, that that's that's where we are at the moment. We've uh, we're doing healthy numbers with uh, our, our socials are doing pretty good. I think we're doing better than a lot of others in that that regard. We've got a pretty good email list. We've got good return customer rate, and um, and one of the things as well that we want to achieve, I think. Uh, as I said, because of where we find ourselves positioned with regards to inventory, Z Ziggy's worked out um, we have A, B, and C tier products. Unfortunately, we, we just can't even make C tier products at the moment. It is so frustrating for us. We just can't touch them because if because it, it that's how we're achieving the 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 levels that we're up at the moment. As I said, that two fifty k a month. We, we just uh, uh, it pains me we've got some great products out there uh, down there that that maybe don't do as well as as the as the a tier products but 
yeah, we've we've just sort of got to push them aside, which which I hate doing. It's leaving my it's leaving as, my back behind. As yeah. frustrating as it is, as you said, it's a great position to be. Yeah, it is demand outstrips supply, and that <clears throat> leads me into a question that we had a little earlier. Um, what what is the reason um, that you're behind in orders? Is it labour, material, space, and will that be covered um, with your use of funds? It's demand. Um, yeah, okay, no, you, you're right, though. Why, why are we behind um, in, in meeting demand? Well, the demand has definitely grown. We, we went from, um, I think that the more we've grown organically and the bigger we've grown our socials, the more demand we've generated, which is great, especially, um, as I said, some of the involvement, especially in the UK, you know, we, we had videos pumped out from Urban Rider and stuff like that. So, we, and um, and we started doing our own videos as well, a lot more. We want to go back to doing some more of that because I think that really works well. We, we've just created more demand than organically we can keep up with. So if you think about it, you know, we, we've got a healthy margin. We've, we've, as I said, we've reached peak Stillman. And, and part of that means we've got, a, a great team here now. I mean, in terms of uh, outlay for salaries, and then the team in, in Vietnam outlays there, and then materials and everything else. And uh, we've just organically we're we're just on a go slow. And because so many of our products, our main products, our ATA products are on a pre-order, we're basically sort of buying tomorrow and reinvesting it back in and back in and back in. And there's that 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 margin, you know, that profit margin that we'd otherwise get goes back into the buying the next big, um, uh, you know, dump of canvas and then into the next big dump of brass and all of that. So it's it's just one of those things. We, we, we really want to get to a point where we've got enough capital behind us so that we can uh, sort of build up that bow wave of, um, of, of raw materials have them there and then and then be able to then put into position uh, strategies to recycle, um, you know, financially on those big orders as they come through. We've got to the point where we've outgrown our little boutique operation and we just need to step it up another level. Yeah. Well, Brad, our Drifter Poncho is sold out two shipments ahead. So that's to give you an idea of where yeah. we are with that cool, we're going to the next one. And now we're focusing on a shipment that's even further than that. So we're reinvesting back into that shipment. And that's just how it's been going for us with the poncho and, and mm -hmm. our product is sweet. All right, cool, we're, we're making the money, but then we're putting that into the next thing. We've grown the poncho from its inception and we made, what? how many ponchos have we made that first shipment? Like 30? 30. We've gone from 30 ponchos a month, for instance, when we first launched it in 2020 to 650 a month. Yeah. yeah. So we've grown that, we've grown that organically. Now we've we've hit that wall. We're kind of like, I don't know what we can do from here without having a big investment in so, to help that. Yeah. Yeah. They're gonna have to start stalling or 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 you know, yeah. And to follow on from that, we have an awesome question here. Obviously, you're raising money to be able to expand. Do you, you know, in, intend in the future to open an Australian manufacturing facility? And obviously, further down the line, do you have any vision of um, facilities in the Americas if you're expanding into those markets? Hey, well, that, that is a good question. Um, look, and, and it's something I want to answer, and we answer this a lot as well. It, it's... It's really not a choice for us about manufacturing in Australia. And I know someone's probably going to get triggered by that. But honestly, it's not even a choice. I tried in the early days and, and I gave up. I contacted industry bodies and asked them and they said, there's no one. I can't. Industry bodies couldn't refer me to anyone. So for the kind of operation I started, as I said, bootstrapping myself from the point where, I, uh, where we started, it just was not possible. It is not possible at the moment. I, I say this, as so we get this a lot, and I say to people, when was the last time you met someone who was a professional tailor? Mm -hmm. How many do you think that we would need to have that industry in Australia? And who's going to do that job? And when was the last time? I mean, they don't even train people for that kind of stuff here, let alone have the materials, let alone have access, uh, sorry, the machines, let alone have access to the materials. So I'm not, I'm not pooping on Australia, everybody. I, I promise you I'm not. But, but the figure is, that's what the figure is, 95% of all fashion and accessories 
in Australia are manufactured overseas. And, 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 and it's a reality. We, we haven't had a manufacturing industry in Australia since the 80s like that. And I just can't see a, a time when that's going to change. Can we invest in that in Australia? Yeah, we could, but I, I wouldn't back me. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's, I'm, someone's definitely going to get triggered with that. I wouldn't back me, honestly. That would, be a bad, that would be a bad investment because it's going to fall over. Uh, <laughs> You know, you do have some companies that manufacture here and people love to bring those examples up. It's, it's, it's you know, different operations. The stuff that we make in clothing requires a human hand to take one piece of fabric and put it together with another piece of fabric and hold it together and then hold it under a machine and then run it through a machine. And there's no automation that can be done for that. So yeah. until someone designs a, a robot, that can can do that and then maneuver things around. We are stuck with manual and uh, things are handmade. That's just the way it is. Now, in terms of the Americas, yeah, we're going to send Ziggy to Mexico next. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't told him yet. <laughs> Fantastic. But Thank there is a possibility you. there as well, especially if if the North uh, America um, market pays out. Yeah, there is a possibility uh, for that that we have actually considered. So it's a good question. Fantastic. We have a couple of questions here that I might jump in and answer for you. Um, we had a few questions about how much you're looking to raise, when would investors expect um, to get their money back, um, and what in, an, in your dream world, and what is the ideal capital injection? So I might just run people through, like give everyone a quick overview um, of the process that we're in. So we're currently in the expression of interest stage right now. And what that means is that we're going out, we're getting market feedback about what interest there is in the market um, in, in terms of range parameters. So I'm sure you guys might have a range that you're looking for, um, which you might want to touch on. But I would encourage everyone to be mindful that these aren't the final figures and we're still working out the parameters of the deal Um and for everyone listening, the full terms of the offer, valuation, share price, investors in um, invest in the business, last 12 months of financial statements will all be outlined in the offer document that will be available when the campaign, oh, sorry, when the offer campaign goes live, which will be kicking off next week. So, you know, if, if you wanted to roughly touch on it, you're welcome, but it will um, all be coming next week. Yeah. Uh, and and I think that's best. Uh, you know. I understand the rules around uh, these these offers, and and uh, you know how, you know Tamman and Birch will have to be careful. And I encourage people, yeah, you've you've really got to look. You've you've got to understand what. Pick up what I'm putting down to a certain extent. Read the financials, understand it yourself, and and work out if this is the right opportunity for you. So um, we we would like to raise uh, over a million. We would like to raise 1.5. Uh, that would be a, a great figure for us because, because you know, everything that I've spoken about could be achieved quite easily if we had that kind of value. Uh, we don't know um, at this stage. Uh, you know, we've got a lot of interest. We've had a lot of interest. It's good. And, and some uh, sort of high net worth individuals are interested as well. And so there, that, that, you know, there's that possibility, um, but, but we just don't know. So at the end of the day, when the offer comes out next Tuesday, you'll see what we're aiming for um, and, and just work out from there what, um, um, you know, based on what I've said, um, whether, whether this is a deal for you. Does that, is that okay, Tamin? Yeah. Correct? I've just put me foot in it. No, no, that's completely fine. And as as you said, you know, the, the business can continue to grow organically, um, yeah. which is amazing. And all of the, you know, detailed use of funds and um, what you're looking to raise will be outlined in the offer document. So, and also just for everybody listening as well, the expression of interest will close on Monday and then the um, early access, the private offer round will open on the Tuesday. So please ensure that you've gotten your expression of interest in um, before we close on Monday if you want to um, ensure that you're going to get in because we do have campaigns that sell out in that private period as well. So yeah, you just want to be careful that you don't miss out on an awesome opportunity. This one's probably going to sell out in the... The first uh, day, I think. Yeah. Right? Right. Right. I'm sure, and, I'm sure. 
So we have another question here um, from someone saying that they appreciate the organic way that you've built your business. Creds to you. Is there any risk um, that you may want? Uh, sorry, is there any risk getting into a point of mass production where the brand and like the quality would be um, of less? Like There's a, a massive big. risk. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Will we, will we ruin the brand by getting too big? Yeah, yeah, we could do. Absolutely. I think that's, um, uh, I, I actually agree with that. And how would you mitigate that? But, you know, you, I guess you've got to look at it in terms of there are brands out there that make luxury goods um, that, that, that that have worked that out. Uh, you know, Versace, Gucci, Gucci, those kinds of brands. Um, not comparing us to Gucci or those or Versace or whatever. We're probably a little better. We have, we have uh, buckles on the back of our bags that can attach your Gucci to your motorcycle. But... Um, yeah, there is a, that, 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 it's, that's a that's a risk, but I just ask you, I just have to ask you to trust me that that's not what I want. I don't want that. If we if we're not making them the way that we're making them now, I don't want to make them. I just, you know, I think it was um, oh, I can't remember the you know, it's you know the 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 quote there about how much tonnage of, of stuff is wasted every year from 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 fashion. I mean, it, it is an incredible amount of waste. No, nah, don't want to be part of it. Not interested. If we can't make it the way we're making it, and I can tell you half the guys, that uh, well, most of the guys that work for me wouldn't be interested either. They love, um, especially the guys there, like they love making the stuff the way that we make it. It's good quality. They enjoy the product. They each take, you know, product home a couple of times a year because uh, I want them to, you know, experience it, touch it, feel it, smell it, you know, use it, give it away or whatever. And um, so yeah, I don't think they'd be interested either. I don't think any of these guys would be. So yeah, we've we've got to expand and we've got to um, scale, but we've got to do it in such a way that we don't um, mess it all up. And I'll promise you that 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 is a concern for all of us. And um, yeah, we don't want to do that. No, I won't. Um, I have another question for you here, um, which I think ties into a question that I've always wanted to <clears throat> ask as well. The question was, as a family-run business, have you considered staying a family business and borrowing the funds from a bank? And I guess that coincides with my question, that is, why equity crowdfund? Um, what inspired you in your capital raising journey to come to equity crowdfunding? Well, look, that's a great question. I didn't know banks lent people money. Do they really lend people money? I heard that somewhere. somewhere. I think I read it on Facebook. Yeah, I saw a meme about it. No, nah, look, that, that was a very cynical response, wasn't it, Tamman? Um, yeah, look, to, to achieve what uh, to achieve what we wanted, we realised that that we were going to have to, um, you know, part of what we wanted to do was was to was to have some equity in the business. I mean, it's a great opportunity for us to have ambassadors in the business as well. And this is something I think the crowdfunding does. Quite a few people recommended it to us for that reason. You know, we build brand ambassadors. Um, and, uh, you know, this is our first experience in raising capital for our business. And to, to be honest, it's been a very interesting experience for us. So, um, yeah, we just think it's a good opportunity to bring... Um, to bring other people into the business, what we're doing, raise raise capital, sell some equity, and bring some other people along for the ride. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Um, another question here is, what is your landed gross margin? Landed gross margin? Uh, oh, it's about, I think at the moment, we're about 70%, 70, 75%, I think, uh, on uh, online. So, yeah, awesome. normally we'd want to be, Probably about five hundred percent markup, as I said, X you know FOB from from Vietnam. Um, but because a lot of our stuff is on pre-order anyway, we've sort of uh, we're just trying to get that positive infantry number and still make it attractive for people to wait a month for it. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, another question here: With your commitment to sustainability and slow fashion, would you consider applying to attain B Corp certification? Uh, yeah, I've, I have uh, I have looked into that. And yes, of course, if we had the time, 
for sure. If we had the time and the uh, and and the you know the opportunity, I, I I do love the idea of that. I have looked into it with a couple of other businesses that I follow. Absolutely. Awesome. And just one more here. Um, at your current margins, how long would it take for you to expand production organically without outside investment? And obviously, that's you'd have to crunch some numbers in. Probably two, 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 two or three weeks. Yeah. <laughs> no. Could, I, don't, I don't know, based on the pre-order cycle that we're stuck in at the moment. Look, I, I think the way that we're going at the moment, organically, I think we could probably hit positive inventory maybe by the end of the year if we go careful, if we really go lean, if we really go careful. But um, but as I said, it's it's... It's a matter of sort of tweaking the engine to achieve that. Um, but that's just positive inventory. That's nothing on top of, you know, that wouldn't allow us to, to, to break into, say, the US market. That wouldn't allow us to, um, you know, with the design stuff that we want to do, we'd have to sort of stay with the same formula that we've got. So if we stay with the same formula we've got now, everything's ticking along nicely, organically. Uh, but once again, who knows what's going to happen in six months and, and suddenly, and, suddenly the demand goes through. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and and to um to this the person who answered this question, um the regulatory body for equity crowdfunding ASIC takes a pretty firm view on future projections. So whether it's product revenue return on investment, um we you, we can't make future projections or forward looking statements without um reasonable grounds. Otherwise, they can be considered misleading. So if you really are looking um for an answer to this question, please contact um the team here. I'm sure they can crunch some numbers in the background um and come up with a more detailed response for you as well. Now. We also just have a final comment here from someone saying Jack Stillman is a people's brand in my view. Keep it up. And we will finish on that note. Unless there are any final questions coming through. I'll give it a second. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. And thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, we will wrap up here and we'll send um, the video around to everyone that attended. Please get your expression of interest in before it closes on Monday. And any questions, just reach out. Yeah, uh, contact us uh, online, uh, one of the chats via one of our uh, Facebook Messenger website. or our chat website. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Temin. Always. Really appreciate you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, guys. Enjoy the rest of your evening. All right. Yeah. Yeah.